the third book in this series being Clinton Cash. The movie tonight is Clinton Cash, but I think it's very important to go back and see the genesis of this, that we're not singling out the Clintons per se in pursuing this, really an evolution of kind of how this whole graft and corruption has developed over time. No, that's exactly right, Steve. You know, I, I lived in Washington, D.C. in the 1980s. I went to undergraduate college there. And I re remember Washington as a town of, you know, uh, above uh, middle class bureaucrats, but it was basically a sleepy town. I came back 20 years later, having moved to Florida, and it changed. I mean, this was a town suddenly where you had lots of wealth. In fact, you and I did a special with Fox News called Boomtown, Boomtown. where you remember we interviewed a guy who worked at Ferrari of Washington, D.C., the Ferrari dealership there, and he actually told us that sales were great, but the problem was that Ferrari North America was unhappy with them because when people bought Ferraris in Beverly Hills, or in South Beach, they finance their purchases. But in Washington, D.C., what do they do? They, they paid, paid cash. cash. They one, paid cash. One of the things that for the audience we should talk about is that uh, the reason we even did Boomtown is that uh, Washington had kind of become like Paris. Yes. You had great boutiques, you had all this wealth, and this was in really the depths of the 2008, it was the first couple of years of the Obama administration, where you would go to, and by the way, we're not trying to blame the Obama administration, this is really a rollover from Bush also, the size of the federal government, you got into a $4 trillion dollar budget, yeah. it was like there were cranes everywhere building new buildings, and you said, this permanent political class that controls this town and controls the wealth of a four trillion dollar federal budget and quite frankly a balance sheet today that has 19 trillion dollars of direct obligations but 200 trillion dollars of off balance sheet obligations that there is a class of people yeah. that run this today that are unaccountable to the American people. Yeah, you used to go to Washington DC because you wanted to serve the country hundred years ago or so. Not saying that everything was perfect, but it was a lot cleaner. Now you can go to Washington, D.C. and do good and do well at the same time. And that's part of the problem. Seven of the ten wealthiest counties in America are counties that border Washington, D.C., and they find all kinds of ways to monetize it. So we talked about, for example, and throw them all out, about insider trading on the stock market and other means of self-enrichment that the political class is exempt from. This is important. It's insider trading. It's trading on material, non-public information that they can actually make a fortune on that's not available to you, the public. In fact, the public would actually be sentenced to long jail sentences that's for right. what happens on Capitol Hill every day. That's exactly right. So, for example, if I know as a bureaucrat that, uh, you know, the Medicare system is going to reimburse at a higher rate for a drug that a pharmaceutical company is offering, I could trade on that information if I'm a congressman and make a lot of money because that's going to make the company a lot of money, Medicare doing that. If you did that as a private citizen, you would risk going to jail, but as a government bureaucrat or as a congressman, it would be okay to do. So in taking this analysis and really your infrastructure of investigations, we went from throw them all out, which are about congressmen enriching themselves, we then went to extortion, yeah. which was really the political class of how they raise money and extort money from businesses and citizens for their own wealth. You then came and said, hey, look, I think the Clintons with this foundation and this Clinton Global Initiative have really set up a paradigm that's quite unique and different yes. than anything else we've seen before. I want to spend a couple of years and really with a team of investigative uh, forensic accountants, SEC lawyers, yeah. uh, internet uh, systems engineers, right. other people, account that you really said, I want to do a very deep dive on this and just look at the time, really, when she was essentially Secretary of State right. and look at this Clinton Foundation Global Initiative and see exactly what went on. No, that's exactly right. So if you're looking at crony capitalism, you're looking at self-enrichment by politicians, as we did to throw them all out and we did an extortion, you have to then come to the point of saying, who's the pinnacle of this? Who does this better than anyone else? That would be Bill and Hillary Clinton. So well before that she announced she was going to be a candidate, uh, we started researching it because they have accumulated a, an amazing fortune. And they've done it. They didn't start a company and take it public. Uh, they didn't create a company that created a whole bunch of jobs. They created an industry, as it were, of the Clinton Foundation and Bill getting paid to give speeches that amounts to hundreds of millions of dollars. And we wanted to do a deep dive. And here's the point that I try to make to people. Whatever you think of Bill and Hillary Clinton, here's the marker that has to be laid down. Steve, if we allow this to go on the way the Clintons have done it, there is simply no reason why five years from now we could not have a Secretary of Defense who says, I'm going to have my spouse hit the lecture circuit and give money to foreign governments, and I as a Secretary of Defense am going to set up a private charity and get the Saudis and all these foreign governments to finance it. Why can't I do it? The Clintons did it and they got away with it. As we know in Washington, D.C., if you give a means of self-enrichment and it's 
legal, it's going to be imitated over and over and over again. So this is far larger than just the Clintons. So the film you're about to see is Clinton Cash. And I want to just set the stage for this. We, Peter tried to answer some very basic questions in the book. The book's a couple hundred pages long. It almost has 100 pages of footnotes. It's a New York Times bestseller. When the book came out in the spring of 2015, it caused an uproar. The New York Times did major investigative pieces off it. The Washington Post did major investigative pieces off it. The book was really lionized as a, a type of uh, analysis that the Clintons were going to have to start to ask questions on. It caused a firestorm. We decided to take that book, which, and to be brutally frank, was a little dry. And the reason it was dry is that Peter came to me and says, look, I don't want to get any of the facts wrong here. Almost wrote it as almost a legal briefing. We took the film and said, let's open this film up, right? Let's open the film up and show really who the, p the people they're, they're, they participate with on a global basis. There's something I think that in the audience that we want people to focus on tonight. There's just two basic questions. Number one, as the Clintons say at the very beginning of the film, when they left the White House in the year 2000, they were not just had no money, not just dead broke, they actually owed many millions of dollars given the legal bills that Bill and Hillary Clinton had because of Monica Lewinsky and other investigations during the presidency. So they had kind of a negative net worth. As the Associated Press reported, not Breitbart, but the Associated Press reported in the spring of 2016, the Clintons' wealth was over $200 million. As Peter said earlier, they never took a company public. They didn't sell big real estate assets. They didn't do a leverage buyout. You know, they didn't have a big media deal. Where did that wealth come from? The Associated Press also reported that $140 million of that wealth came approximately at the time that she was Secretary of State. So the, the film tries to answer the question, how did that come about? In addition, as Peter was writing the book and I was seeing the roughs and the galleys and, and all that as we went through it, I went to Peter one time and I said, you know, what's really shocking to me as a, as a guy that's just kind of looking over your shoulder is that everything in the book is they're really monetizing ideologically what they say they believe. And I said, if you look at this, whether it's arms trading, whether it's nuclear proliferation, whether it is human trafficking, whether it's global warming, climate change, the rainforest, in every what I call vertical, where good, decent people who I may not agree with ideologically, but who have dedicated their lives to work for these either NGOs or not-for-profits or these advocacy groups have literally spent their entire career and never made a penny. In fact, they understand they really can't make a lot of money because they're not-for-profits. If you look at those verticals, the Clintons are actually in a transaction with another guy on the other side of the trade who is the worst guy in the world who wants to exploit that opportunity right. where the Clinton. That is what I said. This is shocking. And as Time Magazine said when they wrote a review of it before he took it to the Cannes film market, that, that villains in this are like a James Bond movie. Right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, that's one of the, the, the surprising things I think people don't realize is when they think of foreign partners with the Clintons who give to the Clinton Foundation or participate in the Clinton Global Initiative, they think it's an insurance company in London or a German media company. It's not. I mean, these are mining companies. These are uh, forestry companies that oftentimes operate in the worst parts of the world where there are massive human rights violations, there's mass lawlessness, there's extreme corruption. So you've got, for example, a Nigerian businessman named Gilbert Shigori, who has been charged and convicted in Europe of money laundering and aiding, abetting a by criminal European enterprise courts, by, by European. European courts, absolutely, has pledged $1 billion with a B to the Clinton Foundation. Now, the Clintons say he doesn't want anything in return. Gilbert Shigori does not want anything in return for this promise. The question is, do you believe them? And when you look at the Russian entities and the entities that operate around the world, do we really believe they don't want anything in return? The answer is no, because the actions that the Clintons have taken to the benefit for these benefactors is overwhelming. They help them get oil drilling rights. They help them get the rights to uh, you know, dr knock down rainforests in Colombia. They are a donor-driven foundation that masquerades or carries a mask of charity and philanthropy around it, and it's created enormous commercial opportunities for the Clintons funders. As I've said many times about making this film, uh, we really didn't make this film for what we call the traditional conservative base. Uh, I think many conservatives have their own views of the Clintons. They've weighed and measured the Clintons over many, many decades. They want to relitigate the 90s sometime or other Clinton activities, whether it's been Gaza email servers. This is not about this. This is really, we made this film for independents, for moderates, for Democrats and progressives to actually see the Clintons, we think, for the first time through your lenses, through the lenses of people that, are, that believe in these causes and have dedicated their lives to these causes. It's quite interesting. 
is that the about the email scandal is that a, a, a big uh, thing in the 1970s and 80s was transparency and accountability by progressive organizations like Ralph Nader, public interest research groups. One of the big tools they came up with was FOIA requests, freedom of information requests. As you can tell with the whole Clinton email scandal, forget the classify that's been that's been released. There's no real release of any of the 30,000 that really deal with the Clinton cash or deals with all of her travel overseas, everything she had to do with these people overseas. As you meet, and people should keep in mind that these are not what we call clubbable individuals. I mean, these are not CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. These are some of the worst bandits and criminals and warlords in the country that you're about to see in the film. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, and you know, Time Magazine's mentioning this is like a Bond film. It really kind of is. You don't necessarily have the little fuzzy cat that they're petting, <laughs> but you have people that are doing business deals with warlords in Africa. You're going to meet people that invest in sovereignty changes. I'd never heard what this meant yeah. before. Investing in sovereignty changes, saying, I'm going to give, say, $50 million to a warlord in Africa so they can seize power in a country, and in exchange, they're going to give me the oil or the diamond rights to the territory they control. These are the kinds of people who are partners, friends, and allies with the Clintons, and the Clintons are doing favors on their behalf. You know, so two, it really yeah. is like a bond film. Two, two things that, that Peter had brought to me during the research was one was the sovereignty changes financing, right. Right. and the other was crisis financing. I said, what are these? I said, one is when there could be a potential change of government in a third world country, and they have all types of people that are involved with them in that, in the global initiative. The other is where you have a situation like Haiti, where yeah. you have these hard Horrible natural disasters, really, in, 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 third, in, in, in third world uh, countries, where all of a sudden all types of money and all types of relief go in, and there's a whole network of people that kind of camp out, that kind of take a vigorish off the top and make sure that money either goes to their own cronies or the money gets skimmed off the top. That's right. Uh, they, they call it crisis capitalism. There's a crisis, and look, we recognize that businesses need to make money, but what you're going to find with the Clintons in Haiti, for example, is there's this massive earth, earthquake that almost instantly kills a quarter million people, 100,000 more that are homeless, huge infrastructure problems. What do the Clintons do? They're in charge of reconstruction. The earthquake affects the southern part of the country. What do they do? The biggest project is in the northern part of the country that's unaffected. Why do they decide to invest rebuilding dollars in the northern part of the country, not in the southern part? Because that's what their donors want. They want this factory built so they can import duty-free goods to the United States. So you're taking, in effect, a crisis situation and monetizing it for the benefit of your donors. Just for the release of this film, uh, this weekend we're putting up on Amazon and in bookstores everywhere. We've actually done a graphic novel. We decided that we had uh, so much enjoyment in making the film and the reaction the film has had. We've decided to go back and take the film. We've actually made a graphic novel. I think it makes the information in the book much more accessible. The book is also coming out of paperback uh, next week. And so you're going to have the ability to buy the book in paperback, to go to your bookstore, or to go to Amazon and buy a graphic, uh, a graphic novel. And we took a lot of time and attention to make sure the artwork was fantastic and the story really flowed. Are you going to get to see this film, which we're dedicated now to getting up online and getting up on digital platforms. The reason we're doing it, we've screened this a number of times. And, and certain times it's had, like at the Republican convention, we had about a 25 percent audience of progressives and Democrats and people came to us afterwards and said we've got to get this film out there people have to see this information so what I want to do without further ado we're going to come back briefly after the film for a quick wrap-up but without further ado uh, I guess featuring Gilbert Sigori, Frank Justra, many characters you're about to meet for the first time and believe me I think some of them will be in your dreams or nightmares tonight also featuring Bill and Hillary Clinton and uh, Peter Schweitzer Clinton Cash next the world is too small, our wisdom too limited, our time here too short to waste any more of it in winning fleeting victories at other people's expense. The Clinton Global Initiative, which brings philanthropists and CEOs together with nonprofits to make concrete commitments aimed at some of the world's toughest problems. Almost 10 years in, they have leveraged billions of dollars in assistance in more than 180 countries. CGI was designed to tackle big global challenges in bite-sized pieces with the conviction that regardless of size or scope our problems will yield to concerted action and innovative partnerships of individuals ngos businesses and governments we have to now find a way to triumph together all the problems that we face from climate change to financial contagion to nuclear proliferation 
are too complex and cross-cutting for any one government or indeed for governments to solve alone. Because we believe that ending hunger is not only possible, but it is both a moral and strategic imperative. Hillary Clinton is trying to shift the spotlight to global warming. The presidential contender unveiling her plans to combat climate change. Together with innovative partners from the public and private sectors, we're working to make homes, universities, and cities more energy efficient. We share a common future, and we are here to find common ground. Women must be empowered. It's classic Bill Clinton by using his birthday to help the causes he champions from combating climate change to obesity and even HIV AIDS. Help bring new dignity and respect to women and girls all over the world. And in the third book in this series being Clinton Cash. The movie tonight is Clinton Cash, but I think it's very important to go back and see the genesis of this, that we're not singling out the Clintons per se in pursuing this, really an evolution of kind of how this whole graft and corruption has developed over time. No, that's exactly right, Steve. You know, I, I lived in Washington, D.C. in the 1980s. I went to undergraduate college there. And I re remember Washington as a town of, you know, uh, above uh, middle class bureaucrats, but it was basically a sleepy town. I came back 20 years later, having moved to Florida, and it changed. I mean, this was a town suddenly where you had lots of wealth. In fact, you and I did a special with Fox News called Boomtown, Boomtown. where you remember we interviewed a guy who worked at Ferrari of Washington, D.C., the Ferrari dealership there, and he actually told us that sales were great, but the problem was that Ferrari North America was unhappy with them because when people bought Ferraris in Beverly Hills, or in South Beach, they finance their purchases. But in Washington, D.C., what do they do? They, they paid, paid cash. cash. They one, paid cash. One of the things that for the audience we should talk about is that uh, the reason we even did Boomtown is that uh, Washington had kind of become like Paris. Yes. You had great boutiques, you had all this wealth, and this was in really the depths of the 2008, it was the first couple of years of the Obama administration, where you would go to, and by the way, we're not trying to blame the Obama administration, this is really a rollover from Bush also, the size of the federal government, you got into a $4 trillion dollar budget, yeah. it was like there were cranes everywhere building new buildings, and you said, this permanent political class that controls this town and controls the wealth of a $4 trillion dollar federal budget and quite frankly a balance sheet today that has $19 trillion dollars of direct obligations but $200 trillion dollars of off balance sheet obligations that there is a class of people yeah. that run this today that are unaccountable to the American people. Yeah, you used to go to Washington DC because you wanted to serve the country hundred years ago or so. Not saying that everything was perfect, but it was a lot cleaner. Now you can go to Washington, D.C. and do good and do well at the same time. And that's part of the problem. Seven of the ten wealthiest counties in America are counties that border Washington, D.C., and they find all kinds of ways to monetize it. So we talked about, for example, and throw them all out, about insider trading on the stock market and other means of self-enrichment that the political class is exempt from. This is important. It's insider trading. It's trading on material, non-public information that they can actually make a fortune on that's not available to you, the public. In fact, the public would actually be sentenced to long jail sentences. The third book in this series being Clinton Cash. The movie tonight is Clinton Cash, but I think it's very important to go back and see the genesis of this, that we're not singling out the Clintons per se in pursuing this, really an evolution of kind of how this whole graft and corruption has developed over time. No, that's exactly right, Steve. You know, I, I lived in Washington, D.C. in the 1980s. I went to undergraduate college there, and I re remember Washington as a town of, you know, uh, above uh, middle class bureaucrats, but it was basically a sleepy town. I came back 20 years later, having moved to Florida, and it changed. I mean, this was a town suddenly where you had lots of wealth. In fact, you and I did a special with Fox News called Boomtown, Boomtown. where you remember we interviewed a guy who worked at Ferrari of Washington, D.C., the Ferrari dealership there, and he actually told us that sales were great, but the problem was that Ferrari North America was unhappy with them because when people bought Ferraris in Beverly Hills, or in South Beach, they finance their purchases. But in Washington, D.C., what do they do? They, they paid, paid cash. cash. They one, paid cash. One of the things that for the audience we should talk about is that uh, the reason we even did Boomtown is that 
uh, Washington had kind of become like Paris. Yes. You had great boutiques, you had all this wealth, and this was in really the depths of the 2008, it was the first couple of years of the Obama administration, where you would go to, and by the way, we're not trying to blame the Obama administration, this is really a rollover from Bush also, the size of the federal government, you got into a $4 trillion budget, yeah. it was like there were cranes everywhere building new buildings, and you said, this permanent political class, that controls this town and controls the wealth of a $4 trillion federal budget and quite frankly a balance sheet today that has $19 trillion of direct obligations but $200 trillion of off balance sheet obligations that there is a class of people yeah. that run this today that are unaccountable to the American people. Yeah, you used to go to Washington DC because you wanted to serve the country hundred years ago or so. Not saying that everything was perfect, but it was a lot cleaner. Now you can go to Washington, D.C. and do good and do well at the same time. And that's part of the problem. Seven of the ten wealthiest counties in America are counties that border Washington, D.C., and they find all kinds of ways to monetize it. So we talked about, for example, and throw them all out, about insider trading on the stock market and other means of self-enrichment that the political class is exempt from. This is important. It's insider trading. It's trading on material, non-public information that they can actually make a fortune on that's not available to you, the public. In fact, the public would actually be sentenced to long jail sentences that's for right. what happens on Capitol Hill every day. That's exactly right. So, for example, if I know as a bureaucrat that, uh, you know, the Medicare system is going to reimburse at a higher rate for a drug that a pharmaceutical company is offering, I could trade on that information if I'm a congressman and make a lot of money because that's going to make the company a lot of money, Medicare doing that. If you did that as a private citizen, you would risk going to jail, but as a government bureaucrat or as a congressman, it would be okay to do. So in taking this analysis and really your infrastructure of investigations, we went from throw them all out, which are about congressmen enriching themselves, we then went to extortion, yeah. which was really the political class of how they raise money and extort money from businesses and citizens for their own wealth. You then came and said, hey, look, I think the Clintons with this foundation. Humbled uh, to receive this Clinton Global Citizen Award. He's actually given awards by Bill Clinton for his conduct as the leader of that country, and they regale him as a great military leader. This is the sort of legitimization that we don't want of these kinds of dictators and leaders. That's the kind of legitimization that the Clintons have engaged in. And they've done it in a way that creates commercial opportunities for donors and friends and allies who want to do business in Africa. Business in Africa means you're dealing with dictators who are going to give you access to, say, mineral rights or oil drilling rights but you're going to have to pay them off. The Clintons partner with foreign entities who want access to Africa, and specifically mining companies or energy companies who need to get concessions for access to oil or natural gas or the rights to mine for gold. Those two make a powerful alliance because these companies will give money to the Clintons, either in the form of speaking fees or in the form of donations to the Clinton Foundation. And the Clintons will then, in effect, do their bidding before the halls of power and corridors of power in Africa. And they will go to foreign governments and encourage them to do business with individuals who are putting money in their pocket. And this leads to some amazing fits of behavior that, in a way, are just reminiscent of 19th century colonialism. A perfect example of this is Ambassador Joe Wilson. Joe Wilson is a longtime friend of the Clintons. In fact, he endorsed Hillary Clinton in the 2008 presidential election. And it was also thought that he might become a senior official in Hillary Clinton's State Department. But the fact of the matter is Joe Wilson was up to something far more nefarious during Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State. In 2009, shortly after she became Secretary of State, when Wilson was the vice chairman of a company called Jarge Capital, they took out a 50-year lease on 400,000 hectares in South Sudan. South Sudan was in the middle of a civil war, and this lease was actually signed with warlords who were involved in the civil war. These individuals who were engaged in massive human rights violations, including the massacre of opponent tribes. And basically what Joe Wilson was engaged in was something called investing in sovereignty changes. They were basically cutting deals, lucrative deals, worth potentially hundreds of millions of dollars with these warlords. And the expectation was simple. These warlords would take power, 
Then they would give them access to these lands where they could make huge amounts of money exploring for natural gas, exploring for oil, and for mineral rights. Ambassador Joe Wilson isn't the only Clinton friend and foundation donor who was working in war-torn countries. Swedish mining investor Lucas Lundin has pledged $100 million to the Clinton Foundation. He did that in 2007. And his most lucrative mining operations are in the war-torn country of the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is a country that perhaps has the most horrific human rights situation on the face of the earth. By the time Lucas Lundin made his $100 million pledge to the Clinton Foundation, his Congo operation was making, quote, staggering profits, end quote, according to his own financial statements. His overall capitalization was $20 billion. But for those profits to remain staggering, U.S. policy under Hillary Clinton had to remain unchanged. That's a problem. Hillary Clinton, as a senator back in 2006, supported something called the Congo Relief Security and Democracy Promotion Act. As the law's name implied, the goal was to bring reform to Congo. That's not something that Lucas Lundin would want. So in 2009, when Hillary became Secretary of State, she reversed course 180 degrees and went from supporting reform in Congo to supporting the status quo, which is exactly what Lucas Lundin would want who of course had committed $100 million to the Clinton Foundation. But Congo isn't the only scandal-plagued country where Clinton benefactors have made millions. Africa's most populous nation, Nigeria, is full of promise, but fulfilling that promise is sometimes a struggle. Plagued by corruption and mismanagement, the resource-rich country has a poverty rate of over 50%. Look at a country like Nigeria, which is really a cesspool of corruption. In fact, people will say it is perhaps the most corrupt country in the world. It's rich in natural resources, it produces a lot of oil, but that money never trickles down to the people. It goes to the oligarchs who run the country, who oftentimes take that money and put it in Swiss bank accounts in a way that, of course, the people of Nigeria can never benefit from. And you see, there's a federal law in the United States which says, if foreign governments that receive U.S. assistance aren't transparent in how they spend that money, that they will not be able to get U.S. foreign assistance anymore. It's about transparency. But there's a way around that law. You can get a waiver from that law. How? By getting the U.S. Secretary of State to grant you a waiver. Uh, we intend to remain very supportive on your reform efforts. Uh, thank you for mentioning uh, the work we did together on the elections, we're also very supportive of uh, the uh, anti-corruption uh, uh, reform efforts, more transparency and the work that uh, you and, and your team is uh, also championing. Uh, because we really believe that uh, uh, the future for uh, Nigeria is limitless. So in the case of Nigeria, they receive hundreds of millions of dollars in U.S. foreign assistance. They've not made progress in being more transparent. And of course, they've gotten exemptions from Hillary Clinton while she was Secretary of State. What's so curious about this is what was happening commercially to the Clintons while this was going on. Bill Clinton, for the first time ever, gets paid highly lucrative speeches in Nigeria, which had never happened before. In fact, he gets paid to do two speeches for $700,000 apiece by a businessman in Nigeria who just happens to be close with the president of that country. Keep in mind, by the way, that his normal speaking fee is less than $200,000 a speech. So this was an enormous payday for Bill Clinton. Okay, now we'll begin the panel. One of the pinnacles of power in that country is a gentleman named Gilbert Chigori. Gilbert Chigori, who has committed $1 billion to the Clinton Global Initiative, is connected to another individual in the Clinton orbit. That would be Mark Rich, the billionaire who was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list that was suddenly and surprisingly pardoned by Bill Clinton in 2001. Mark Rich, you might recall, is somebody who is trading oil with the Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran at the same time that the Ayatollah was holding 50 Americans hostage. He also had a long history of busting UN sanctions by trading oil with the apartheid regime in South Africa, 
and a whole host of other nefarious governments. Well, Gilbert Chiguri, the high Clinton donor, was business partners with Mark Rich. Together, they sopped up oil assets in Nigeria and sold them on the oil market for the benefit of a corrupt individual who was leading Nigeria at the time named General Abacha. Abache smuggled, by some estimates, four to eight billion dollars out of the country and put them in European bank accounts. Gilbert Chigori was indicted and convicted in Europe for helping him to do that. He was charged for aiding and abetting a criminal enterprise and on money laundering charges. And the suffering that ends up being done here is by the people of Nigeria who see their leadership getting a pass from the United States the elites in those countries are getting rich, the Clintons are getting rich, and the money somehow never trickles down to the people of Nigeria. Sadly, this theme of resources not trickling down to those most in need is a common one when it comes to the Clintons. As we told you at the start of tonight's program, a major magnitude earthquake has hit the island of Haiti in the Caribbean. The quake measured around seven points on the Richter scale and its epicenter fell just 10 miles from the capital Port-au-Prince. Haiti's ambassador to the U.S. has described the event as a catastrophe of major proportions. So far, we have no information regarding the casualties. The, the war is coming to an end! It was a big earthquake. It lasts like 15 seconds, I think. Probably the most devastating humanitarian crisis that Hillary Clinton faced during her tenure at the State Department was the tragic earthquake in Haiti. It happened in January of 2010, and literally in a matter of seconds, 250,000 people were estimated to have died, and a large portion of the Haitian infrastructure and economy was just decimated. It was a crisis on a massive scale. The United States is offering our full assistance to Haiti and to others in the region. Uh, we will be providing both civilian and military disaster relief and humanitarian assistance. And our prayers are with the people who have suffered, uh, their families uh, and their loved ones. In the days and weeks that followed the earthquake in January of 2010, Hillary Clinton made visits to Haiti. And here's the latest on Haiti. U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton arrived in Port-au-Prince just about an hour ago. She is the highest ranking U.S. official in Haiti right now since Tuesday's earthquake. She's meeting with Haitian leaders and international officials to discuss the rescue and relief effort. In fact, on her first visit, which occurred days after the earthquake, they literally had to stop traffic going in to the airport at Port-au-Prince. There, of course, were relief supplies that were being flown in, but that traffic was stopped so the Secretary of State could come and assess the damage. There is a perception, and there have been complaints or reports of bottlenecks that there's a lot of aid coming in, but it's very hard to get it out to the people who need it. That's just not true. The aid is coming in, we're getting it out, there's just not enough of it yet. She flew in with her political aides on a large federal airplane. She landed at the airport, she made a large press conference, made statements about her commitment to rebuilding this country, and then she was soon whisked away, headed back to Washington, D.C. Theirs is a city in ruins, a country which can do little but wait for help to arrive. The international community responded in the way that you would expect it to. That is, large amounts of money were committed, up to $13 billion from international relief organizations. And of course, you had the official role of the State Department, which would be point on U.S. taxpayer dollars going to Haiti for the purposes of relief. I want to assure the people of Haiti that the United States is a friend, a partner, and a supporter. Hillary Clinton's State Department would oversee the reconstruction effort, with Chief of Staff Cheryl Mills responsible for the allocation of U.S. tax dollars through USAID. And Bill Clinton, already appointed special envoy to Haiti for the United Nations, was named co-chair of the Interim Haiti Recovery Commission, along with a former Haitian prime minister. 
I hope it will be rebuilt in, in a much stronger and more sustainable way, and I think the Haitians want that. So this was clearly a Clinton operation from the beginning. Now, the Haitians had their own ideas about how best to rebuild their country. They wanted new roads. They wanted buildings rebuilt. And that's what you would expect. This is how you recover from an earthquake. The problem is that the Clintons had their own agenda, the interests of major donors who had a vested interest in spending that money in Haiti in ways that would benefit them. And so you immediately had this clash between the Haitians and the Clintons. And Haitians complained almost immediately that they were shut out of the decision-making process, that it was really Bill Clinton and a few of his friends that were calling the shots in the IHRC. And they made some monumentally bad decisions that not only didn't benefit the Haitian people, but ended up putting money in the pockets of major Clinton donors who had economic stakes in Haiti. We have been united behind a single goal, making investments in this country's people and your infrastructure. So it's a classic example of what some people call disaster capitalism. Disaster capitalism in that a natural disaster creates opportunities for rebuilding to take place, but also for self-enrichment to take place. And if you look at the Clintons and the promises that were made and the results that actually followed, it is a tragic story of crony capitalism gone awry. The single largest relief project that the United States committed taxpayer dollars to, $124 million to be exact, was a project called Caracol, a textile factory that was built in the northern part of the country that was supposed to create some 60,000 jobs and was supposed to create tremendous economic growth. There's a problem here already. You see, the earthquake affected the southern part of Haiti. The northern part of the country was entirely unaffected. But who were the beneficiaries of this? Companies like Gap, Target, and Walmart, to name a few. The Caracol factory was built, but it didn't create 60,000 jobs. It created barely 5,000 jobs. But the major American companies who got textiles tariff-free, made at low wages, benefited enormously. And the end effect on the Haitians was very, very minimal. If you look at some of the infrastructure projects that were undertaken, the Clintons had very grand plans to uh, build large tracts of homes, and there were contractors that were selected for those projects. Sometimes the contractors had experience, sometimes they did not. There's one company in Florida that spent a million dollars getting equipment into Haiti. They had experience in disaster relief, but according to the owners of that company, they only made a small donation to the Clinton Foundation. And guess what? they didn't get any relief contracts. On the other hand, the contractors who did win the awards were given the opportunity to build homes, and in some instances were supposed to build tens of thousands of homes for Haitians. They ended up building a fraction of that. For instance, the New Settlements program was supposed to build 15,000 homes for $53 million. Instead, it built 2,600 homes, less than a quarter of the original estimate, for $90 million, or $47 million over budget. And they got away with it. So you had contracts going to these relief organizations that were also involved with the Clinton Global Initiative. And you had this one organization, Dahlberg, that was supposed to do an assessment for relocating people that suffered from the earthquake. They determined that people should be moved to a site that happened to be on a cliff that was highly unstable. USAID's Inspector General reviewed Dahlberg's recommendations and found them basically unusable. One member of the USAID shelter team was quoted by Rolling Stone magazine as saying that the recommendations were so bad, it looked like the team never even got out of their SUVs. Another person said that only one of the people that was sent to Haiti by Dahlberg actually spoke French. 
Telecom mogul Dennis O'Brien is one of the world's richest people, and he's finding opportunities in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. The Irish billionaire is the largest private investor in Haiti through his company, Digicel, and he's now leading the Clinton Global Initiative efforts down in Haiti. Probably no one came out better in the Haitian reconstruction effort than an Irish billionaire named Dennis O'Brien. He is a Clinton Foundation donor, giving them between five and $10 million. He helped arrange speeches for Bill Clinton, too. The interest of the Obama administration, particularly the uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, you know, all the, the, all the different things that have happened to help Haiti get up off the floor have been led by the U.S. And he was the owner of something called Digicel, which is a cell phone company at the time of the earthquake. As part of that relief effort, the State Department run by Hillary Clinton wanted to fund a mobile money transfer service that would allow Haitian citizens to transfer and receive money on their phones. Well, Digicel applied to be the recipient of that grant money. Four weeks after their application, Digicel actually sponsored a speech for Bill Clinton in Jamaica, and they paid him $225,000. And as it turns out, within four months of that speech, Digicel would receive the first installment of that grant money. The earthquake actually has been great for Digicel and Dennis O'Brien. More than four years since a magnitude 7.0 earthquake devastated Haiti, and outrage there is growing over the largely failed reconstruction effort, despite the hundreds of millions of dollars in aid that has been collected and spent by the IHRC, the Interim Haiti Recovery Commission. So whether you're talking about housing or cell phones, you see that the people that are closest to the Clintons have made out very well from the Haitian earthquake. The rest of the country, the ordinary people of Haiti, not so much. Haitian activists stage a protest outside Hillary Clinton's Manhattan office. The demonstrators claim billions of dollars were stolen through the Haiti Reconstruction Commission headed by Bill Clinton. They also say Haiti was used as a cover for foreign governments to funnel kickbacks of possibly hundreds of millions of dollars through the Clinton Foundation. They say it was done in exchange for favors that Hillary was doing for them as Secretary of State. The tragedy is we had an opportunity to rebuild in a way that would give the people of that country hope. Sadly, that opportunity was squandered, and what took place, rather than rebuilding Haiti, was the self-enrichment by friends of the Clintons. For all of Bill Clinton's talk about building Haiti back better, the fact remains that the most visible evidence of Clinton's role in the recovery isn't the improvement of daily life for everyday Haitians, but the construction of new luxury hotels just miles from the folks who have been living in tarps USAID handed out immediately after the earthquake. We are telling the world of the crimes that Bill and Hillary Clinton are responsible for in Haiti. But while the world eventually lost interest in Haiti's recovery, the influence and connections afforded to donors from the Clinton Foundation appear to have been lessons learned by others. So how much do connections to the Clintons matter when you're talking about Haiti? Consider the case of gold mining. The government of Haiti had not granted a gold mining concession in 50 years. They decided to do so during the reconstruction of their country, which was being overseen by Bill and Hillary Clinton. What company did they select to get this gold mining permit? A company called VCS Mining. VCS Mining had very little experience in gold mining, but what did they have? They had connections. Shortly after they got that concession, someone joined their board of directors. It just happened to be Tony Rodham, brother of Hillary Rodham Clinton. It was a true disaster, a true disaster that followed the earthquake, which was the natural disaster. This was the man-made Clinton-caused disaster in relief that led to the wasting of enormous sums of money, the enrichment of elites that were friends with the Clintons, and the Haitians were left in a situation where their life was really not much better than it was the day after the earthquake happened. An ambitious pipeline is firing off a war of opinions. Environmental activists marched in Washington today to protest plans for the Keystone XL oil pipeline. A $7 billion project to transport 800,000 barrels of tar sands oil a day from Canada down to the Gulf Coast. 
In Washington, a showdown on the Senate floor today over the Keystone XL pipeline. The vote to approve the controversial pipe project uh, has big political implications. The pipeline would create 20,000 jobs, but opponents say the environmental risk is too great. One of the touchstones of the climate change debate has been the Keystone XL pipeline. It's designed to carry oil from Canada through the United States to refineries in Louisiana and in Texas. The environmental movement has wholeheartedly rejected this deal from the beginning because they believe that it's going to further contribute to the problems of climate change. Now, you would think that the Clintons would be opposed to the Keystone XL pipeline deal because of those concerns. And perhaps they might be, except for one or two problems, or should I say one or two million problems. You see, when Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State in late 2008, there was already an issue related to the Keystone XL pipeline sitting on her desk. She was going to have to sign an environmental and economic impact statement and decide whether the Keystone XL pipeline should go forward. At that precise time, Bill Clinton gets a lucrative offer of nearly $2 million to give 10 speeches in Canada for the first time ever from a company called TD Bank Investment Group. He gave the last speech in May of 2011. Three months later, Hillary's State Department releases an environmental impact statement that was seen as largely supportive of the Keystone XL pipeline in a way that was massively controversial. Hillary Clinton, in effect, was betraying the environmental movement by greenlighting this deal, when she had in her hands the power to kill this deal in its crib. It was shocking. Organizations like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth were stunned. They wanted investigations, but everybody was mystified. Nobody could understand why Hillary Clinton would sign off on this deal, particularly when she had been in favor of dealing with climate change. And her boss, Barack Obama, by all indications, seemed to be opposed to this deal as well. It's also a time for a new approach to climate change. We know we've got to deal with global warming. We're seeing the effects of it. We need to invest in clean energy technology today so that we can create new high paying jobs to protect our environment, to grow our economy and to finally break our addiction to foreign oil. How did we go from the Clintons being in favor of fighting climate change and dealing with fossil fuel dependence to Hillary Clinton signing off on the Keystone XL pipeline? The evidence that we found was that it was about the money. This was not a philosophical change. This was not a new way of thinking about global warming. This was a way of taking $2 million in cash to essentially buy a decision by the Secretary of State. Why is the TD Bank Investment Group so interesting? Because they just happen to be one of the largest shareholders in the Keystone XL pipeline itself. When we looked at Bill Clinton's pattern of giving speeches, we looked at who was paying him, when they were paying him, and if they have ever paid for a speech before. What's so stunning is that TD Bank had never sponsored a speech by Bill Clinton before. And then suddenly, in late 2008, when Hillary Clinton has been announced to be the Secretary of State, and when sitting on her desk is the matter of the Keystone XL pipeline, they suddenly decide to sponsor these speeches. And when people realize that the Clintons had pocketed about $2 million at the precise time Hillary Clinton was making this decision, it all now suddenly made sense. Because as we've seen repeated over and over and over again, when it comes to the Clintons, you have to follow the money. And in the case of the Keystone XL pipeline, they seem to have abandoned their principles, their commitment, as it was, to combating global warming and dealing with our dependence on fossil fuels. They jettisoned that when $2 million showed up and suddenly came out in favor of the Keystone XL pipeline. When you see this sort of pattern of behavior, you can't come to any other conclusion that it's a system of pay to play. And again, other entities appear to have picked up on this business model too. Well, Bill Clinton has been paid enormous sums of money over the years to give speeches. On average, he gets a little less than $200,000 per speech. But something happened in late 2008. His speaking fees skyrocketed after he'd been out of office for years. The reason was his wife had become Secretary of State. In fact, 11 of the 13 speeches for which Bill Clinton has been paid half a million dollars or more occurred precisely when Hillary was the most powerful diplomat in the world.
You will never contribute to an organization that will give you a higher probability of having your good intentions turn into real positive changes in other people's lives. That will give you a better chance than what you've done here tonight. His single biggest speech payday came from the Swedish telecom company Ericsson. And it's a very, very unusual and troubling story. Now, Ericsson is a Swedish telecom company that in 2009 and 2010 was in trouble with Hillary Clinton's State Department because Ericsson was selling a lot of telecom equipment to Iran, to Belarus, and to other oppressive governments about which the State Department was concerned. Ericsson risked being put on a list by the federal government in the United States for trading with an enemy state. There was actually an effort being put forward in Washington to broaden Iranian sanctions to include the very technologies that Ericsson was selling to the Iranian government. So it's against this background that Ericsson decided now might be a good time to hire Bill Clinton to give a speech. They had never paid for a speech by him before, and they decided to go in big, $750,000 for a single speech. Seven days after he gave that speech, Hillary's State Department came out with a statement which said, we are not going to broaden sanctions on Iran to include technologies like telecom. We're going to rely and expect companies like Ericsson to police themselves. It was a massive win for Ericsson. Ericsson was able to avoid having to deal with a regulatory battle in Washington, giving up contracts that were highly lucrative in these countries, and being put on a list that would create an enormous diplomatic problem for them all because essentially they paid Bill Clinton to give a speech for $750,000. Will you continue to give speeches? Oh yeah, for I, I gotta pay our bills. So the question is, why do we see the Clintons reversing decades of policy positions that they've held so closely on issues like human rights and environment? And a big clue comes from the folks that are giving the Clinton Foundation literally tens of millions of dollars. And one, if not the biggest donor to the foundation, is a Canadian named Frank Joustra. Joustra is in the mining business, hardly something you'd call environmentally friendly and he has interests all over the world. And he used his relationship with the Clintons to benefit those interests, regardless of the environmental concerns. A great example of this is what happened in Colombia. What's so interesting about the relationship that the Clintons have with Frank Joustra is they tend to show up in these foreign countries together at the same time. Frank Joustra's made billions of dollars over the years in the so-called penny stock market in Canada, which is highly open to manipulation. He's been very successful in this area. Now, the Vancouver Stock Exchange is not like the New York Stock Exchange in the United States. This is the stock market or an exchange that is dominated by penny stocks, made up of a lot of natural resources stocks. It's sort of the wild, wild west of investing. It's called Dodge City sometimes. And the reason is because there's a lot of speculators, there's a lot of misinformation that's put around, and there are a lot of mining companies that don't really have any assets, but will proclaim to have gotten the rights to some lucrative gold mine, let's say. Uh, and then they send that news out to the public in the hope that it will lead to a flood of people buying the penny stock so the shareholders can sell their assets. So in June of 2010, Bill Clinton and Frank Joustra fly to Bogota, Colombia. And who arrives there at roughly the same time? Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. The big thing from the news conference was where Bill and Hillary were dining the other night in Bogota. Uh, I had a chance to talk to you about her dinner experience in the Zona Rosa. And here's what she had to say. Dinner was good? Yeah, it was excellent in every way. So it was like... Eating in the States, but eating in Bogota. <laughs> well, it was, uh, it was a real treat to be in Bogota and uh, to be with people who love this city so much, including my husband. Now, in her memoirs, Hillary Clinton says that this is just a happy coincidence. But when you see what follows, you realize that this is no coincidence. The following morning, Bill Clinton has a breakfast meeting with the outgoing president of Colombia, President Uribe. Then, like a tag team, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has a noon lunch meeting with him, and she grants him several favors, including technical agreements that the Colombian government wants. 
In the days that follow, something dramatic happens. Frank Justra has three companies that get major concessions from the Colombian government, Pacific Rubiales, Petro America, and Prima Colombia Properties. One of those, Prima Colombia Properties, gets a concession to cut timber in a rainforest in Colombia along the Pacific coast. And that timber is not intended to export to the United States, but is intended for export to China. There's an outrage and upset environmentalists who realize what's going on, and eventually that permit is yanked by a future president of Colombia, but not before Frank Justra's company is able to profit from cutting down these rainforests, which again is a behavior that runs so contrary to what the Clintons profess to be in favor of. We all know that in order to build low carbon economies of the future, we need sustainable forests. I also know the future of our planet depends on healthy, standing forests. They've talked about the problems of deforestation. They've talked about the problems of the need for successful growing forests to mitigate a carbon dioxide in the air. And yet, when this commercial opportunity was presented to a major donor of theirs, they seemed to be very much supportive of that and, in fact, helped to get him those concessions. He deserves the credit for this. This was his idea, not mine and he raised the money. And it's an astonishing achievement. My job is to make sure that it's not in vain, that he gets the return on his investment and his compassion and his commitment. The Clintons appear to have changed their stance on issues even more significant than the environment in ways that benefit those who have put money in their pockets. I represent a president and a country committed to a vision of a world without nuclear weapons and to taking the concrete steps necessary that will help us get there. The Indian nuclear deal, I think, is so troubling because this is a core national security issue. One of the signature achievements in foreign policy for Bill Clinton was pushing the test ban treaty and the non-proliferation treaty. Today in New York, the United Nations General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to adopt the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty and open it for signature later this month. The MPT has been sort of the holy grail when it comes to nuclear disarmament, something that the Clintons have been supportive of, not just for years, but for decades. That was all thrown asunder in 1998 when the Indian government tested nuclear weapons underground. India's action threatens the stability of Asia and challenges the firm international consensus to stop all nuclear testing. These were tests that truly shocked the world. Even the CIA was not aware that these tests were about to take place. Clinton's reaction was volcanic. He felt betrayed by the Indian government and as a result, he imposed sanctions on India, essentially saying, you're not going to get access to US nuclear technology until you sign the MPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. In 2005, the Indian government wanted to get these sanctions lifted. Not only do they have an interest in expanding their civilian nuclear base, they live in a neighborhood where some pretty tough customers and rivals have nuclear weapons themselves. First of all, you've got Pakistan, which is right next door, which is widely believed to have nuclear weapons. And then you have China, a longtime rival of India, which has a nuclear arsenal. The Clintons said that they were in favor of giving the Indian government some access, but the problem is it didn't go nearly as far as the Indian government wanted. So in 2005, they started making donations to the Clinton Foundation. This morning, yet another shady donation to the Clinton Foundation has surfaced, this time tied to a donor from India, apparently a friend of Bill Clinton. We're talking about tens of millions of dollars from Indian interests flowing into the Clinton Foundation. And we're talking about at least hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in speeches that Bill Clinton was paid by interested parties in the Indian nuclear deal. 
Amar Singh, according to Clinton disclosures, has given between one and five million dollars to the Clinton Foundation in the push to get them to support Indian access to nuclear technology. He's a member of parliament who has gotten in fistfights on the floor of the parliament, who's been charged with bribing members of parliament to get certain pieces of legislation passed. You see, the problem is when you ask Amar Singh, he says, it wasn't my money. I don't have that kind of money. I couldn't have given him that amount of money. And in fact, when you look at Indian public records, you see that Amar Singh doesn't have a net worth anything close to being able to give that amount of money. So where did the money come from? Well, sometimes the most obvious answer is the correct one. Sant Chantwal is an Indian businessman who has been close to the Clintons for years. He pledged to raise $5 million for her 2008 presidential campaign. And Bill Clinton was at his son's wedding. They actually named him as a trustee of the Clinton Foundation. When Hillary Clinton was first running for the Senate in 2000, Sant Chatwell was in trouble with a federal agency called the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. He basically owed them millions of dollars from unpaid loans. Well, in 2000, Chatwell throws a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton, and he brings in half a million dollars. A few months later, with Bill Clinton still president of the United States, Sant Chatwell's case with the FDIC was abruptly settled for a mere $125,000. So basically, the federal government got pennies on the dollar. He would actually go on to plead guilty for funneling $180,000 in illegal campaign contributions to Hillary Clinton, among others. And no one seems to have made the connection. Well, maybe one reason no one made the connection is because the Clinton Foundation mysteriously erased any mention of Sant Chatwell from the website once he had admitted to his illegal activity. So here we are years later, and we've got this donation in a guy's name who swears he didn't actually make the donation. And you've got this longtime Clinton benefactor who actually gets the highest civilian award in India because of his role in changing Hillary Clinton's mind on this nuke deal. Tan Singh Chatwal says he's worked with everybody and even laid the foundation of the Indo-US nuclear deal. So the Indian government says that they've given you this award for your role in pushing the Indo-US nuclear deal forward. How exactly would you describe the role you played in this? Well, I can tell you Indian nuclear power deal. If you look at it, I'm the first one I laid the foundation. On the eve of the vote in 2008 to approve Indian access to US civilian nuclear technology, Amar Singh, who barely knows Hillary Clinton, had a two-hour meeting with her where they discussed the Indian nuclear deal. Amar Singh says that the dinner meeting resulted in her telling him that she was supportive of the deal and that she was making efforts to make sure that the deal did get through. And lo and behold, by 2008, Hillary Clinton was fully in support and in favor of this policy in a way that was a complete reversal of the position that she had taken before. In other words, the flow of money had led the Clintons to change their positions on the non-proliferation treaty, and specifically, India getting access to US nuclear technology. This was a decision that was wholly out of step, wholly inconsistent with the progressive liberal agenda. Hillary Clinton made a decision of reversing her previous position after the flow of funds to the Clinton Foundation and her husband gave some speeches in India. But this wouldn't be the last time Hillary reversed herself regarding nuclear weapons technology. Shockingly, Bill and Hillary would end up receiving money from folks that were looking to make something happen a lot closer to home. I think the Russian uranium story is perhaps the most shocking and most blatant example of how the Clintons operate. This is a story about the Russian state nuclear agency, American uranium, $145 million in cash, and the Clintons. At the end of the day, this is a story about buying influence and selling influence. The Clintons are the sellers of influence, the Canadian investors and the Russians are the buyers. Bill Clinton had gone to the Central Asian country of Kazakhstan in 2005 with Frank Joustra. Kazakhstan is a country that's been run since the collapse of the Soviet Union by a dictator named Nazarbayev, who shuts down political opposition and tortures political opponents. 
The ostensible purpose of the visit to Kazakhstan by Bill Clinton was to talk with Nazarbayev about AIDS HIV. The problem is Kazakhstan really does not have an AIDS HIV problem. So that explanation really doesn't make sense. What makes far more sense is that Frank Juster wanted access to very lucrative Kazakh uranium mines. Kazakhstan is one of the largest producers of uranium in the world. Bill Clinton arrives there with Frank Justra, and they have a series of meetings with Kazakh officials. There's a press conference where Bill Clinton stands with the dictator of Kazakhstan, and he praises the human rights record. He praises that elections are being held in the country, and he even says that Kazakhstan should head up something called the OSCE, which is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Think about that for a second. Bill Clinton is saying that a known human rights violator who's been condemned by human rights organizations around the world should head up a human rights organization. They go from a press conference to a dinner where Frank Justra, Nazarbayev, the dictator of Kazakhstan, and Bill Clinton meet and talk. Well, two days after that meeting, Frank Justra finally gets his uranium concessions worth hundreds of millions of dollars. A couple of weeks after that, Bill Clinton gets his $30 million from Frank Justra, the first payment in what will become more than $100 million in pledges and commitments and donations made by Frank Justra. So it's really, in a way, a simple story in that they all are walking away from the table with something that they want. Nazarbayev is getting the legitimacy of an ex-president, saying what a nice and kind leader he is. Frank Juster gets his uranium concession, and Bill Clinton and his foundation get cold, hard cash. Now let's move to chapter two of this story, which is even more sinister. You see, the international uranium market is very competitive. The Kremlin sees dominance and control of the uranium market as a source of national power. Frank Justra takes that uranium concession he got in Kazakhstan and puts it into a company in a so-called reverse merger, which was one way for a private company to go public to form something called Uranium One. It's a company traded on the stock market in Canada, and they start acquiring uranium concessions in places like Wyoming, Texas, New Mexico, and Utah. And by 2009, they have what is expected to be 50% of future uranium production in the United States. This gets the interest of Vladimir Putin and the Russian government. And in fact, there are State Department cables that were leaked through WikiLeaks, which show that Hillary was aware of the fact that the Russians took great care to try to dominate the international uranium market. Well, the Russians want to buy this asset, and they offer a 40% overprice on the share of the stock. And for this transaction to go through, it has to be approved by the US federal government. Why? Because uranium is regarded as a critical industry in the United States. After all, this is used for our civilian nuclear reactors and goes into nuclear weapons. So it goes before the federal government where it needs to be signed off by a series of federal agencies, including the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. As Hillary Clinton is contemplating this, shareholders in Uranium One, including Frank Justra, have sent more than $145 million to the Clinton Foundation. The chairman of that company at the precise time is a guy named Ian Telfer, who is also making donations to the Clinton Foundation, as is Frank Holmes, who is another major Uranium One shareholder. And Hillary Clinton, who has a record of opposing precisely these kinds of deals, comes out and says, you know what, I think this is a good deal. Let's let Vladimir Putin take control of what is now 20% of US uranium production. Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton are the only figures in American politics who are willing to do this deal and who could actually pull it off because they had a reputation that runs so contrary to what they're doing. I mean, this is what the Clinton Foundation does, right? This is what they talk about politically, their support for human rights, their concerns about proliferation, their concerns about issues related to Russian aggression. There's no doubt that when Putin came back in and said he was going to be president, uh, that did change the relationship. We have to stand up to his bullying and- What's so interesting when you consider this uranium deal are the actions of a small Canadian investment firm called Salida Capital. Salida Capital, in 2010, as this deal was going down, 
committed to give millions of dollars to the Clinton Foundation, and they also sponsored a speech by Bill Clinton in Canada. Salida Capital is also the name of a wholly owned subsidiary of Rosatom. Who is Rosatom? Well, this is the government agency in Russia that controls their nuclear arsenal, that built nuclear reactors in Iran, and engages in nuclear technology exchanges with rogue countries like North Korea. What this means, in essence, is that the Russian government, specifically Rosatom, was funneling money through a subsidiary directly to the Clinton Foundation. But the payday didn't end there. Four months before Hillary Clinton's State Department would sign off on the Russian purchase of Uranium One, Bill Clinton got paid $500,000 to give a single speech in Moscow. He was being paid by a firm called Renaissance Capital, which has a long history of association with Russian intelligence services. What makes this speech stand out is not only the timing of when he's being paid, but the amount that he's being paid. You see, the last time Bill Clinton gave a speech in Russia was five years earlier. At that time, he was paid about a one-third of what he was being paid this time. Why is Russian control of 20% of U.S. uranium so troubling? If you're in an era where nuclear weapons are a reality, where nuclear energy is an important component of energy production in the United States, and in increasingly around the world, Control of uranium is absolutely crucial. And unlike oil or natural gas can be found in so many places around the world, there are precious few places where you can find significant and large amounts of uranium that you can produce on a commercial scale. What we've essentially done is handed this precious resource to Vladimir Putin and the Russian government. They're not only engaged in aggression in places like Ukraine, but they've been very aggressive in fighting American interests around the globe. Russia's not an ally, Russia's not a friend. Vladimir Putin's Russia is a rival of the United States, and yet we've given them control over this precious resource. Uranium, the key mineral in nuclear generation, is a domestic resource. This is what's gonna power America. I think a lot of people in middle America would be surprised to know that the Russian government is doing business in places like Colorado or Wyoming or Utah. These are small mining towns. These are operations that have existed for a while, that have been under the control of American companies or for a while Canadian companies. But it's now Russian companies that control this, and those companies are controlled by the Russian government. Having read through the archives of the KGB, the files that they have been released, I can tell you that they look at the United States as weak and ineffectual. This is a thuggish government that is engaged in massive human rights violations. There are opponents of this regime that have been killed or have disappeared. There's been persecution of human rights organization. There's been persecution of homosexuals. And it's shocking and stunning to me that there has not been more attention focused to this fact, that we have given this critical resource to somebody who is engaged in so much nefarious behavior. Greetings from Washington. I want to thank all of you for your work to root out corruption that weakens economic development, feeds black markets and organized crime, and undermines the promise of democracy. As we work together to eradicate corruption in our own countries, we should also maintain the highest standards of transparency and accountability in our development efforts around the world. Corruption in emerging markets and fragile democracies undermines the confidence of citizens and investors alike, while responsible governance helps to foster sustainable economic development and political stability. I believe in the oldest adage in American politics, which is, follow the money. Enormous amounts of money have flowed to the Clintons, from foreign governments, foreign financiers, and businesses. Some of that money lands in their pocket, some of it lands in their foundation. It's a pattern we've seen repeated over and over and over again all around the world. It's not a coincidence. Money exchanges hands and favors are done. Now Clinton friends and supporters will say there's no smoking gun. But look at American political history. People are convicted all the time for a pattern of behavior where, for example, they're engaged in insider trading on the stock market. So for example, you have a foreign corporation or a foreign government that wants something from the State Department while Hillary Clinton is Secretary of State. 
they will make a large payment to the Clinton Foundation. That will be followed by favorable action on their behalf. If that happens one or two times, you might say, look, it's just a coincidence. But when you see the pattern recreated over and over and over again, you have to recognize that these events are connected. They've created a model for massive self-enrichment that allows you to go into so-called public service, but get extremely rich at the same time. And when friends and allies say that the Clintons aren't really that interested in money, their actions show otherwise. What's so shocking to a lot of people is that making of that money requires them to betray their progressive values. The environment, labor unions, women's rights, human rights. The Clintons are doing business and growing rich with the favor of the very individuals who you would expect to be their political opposites. For a very long time in American history, and probably still to this day, one of the worst things that could be said about you as a politician is that you are on the take from foreign interests. What the Clintons have essentially done is busted down the door and robbed the bank of that concept. So when people think of the Clintons taking foreign money, they think it's a, maybe an insurance company from Great Britain, or they think it's from a supermarket chain in Canada. The fact of the matter is a lot of that money comes from the darkest, worst corners of the world. Are countries like Nigeria and Russia in the habit of giving money to politicians and not wanting something back? The Clintons are glad to take this money. It's made them fabulously wealthy. But what has it done for us? Before we had to worry about money from Wall Street and big labor, now we have to worry about it coming from around the world and infecting our politics and damaging our politics, everything from our uranium policy to our human rights policy. Nothing seems to be safe anymore. How is this not corruption? How is this not a crime? With the Clintons, nothing is sacred. Everything is for sale. But we are the ones who are paying the price. Maybe, just maybe, the American people are tired of being sold out. Well, welcome back. I hope you uh, enjoy. I hope you enjoyed watching that as much as Peter and I uh, had making it. it. Is the fourth film we've done together. Yeah. Uh, we've done big war films. We've done films about uh, political ideology, and now we've done one about uh, global crony capitalism. You know, seeing it once again as you and I sat here and watched it at the same time we played on the site, 
it's a, it's a very sobering uh, film because I think it shows you how detached, and th this is beyond political ideology, I think it shows you how our government and the concept of how people think what government's for has so changed radically from what the founders of, the, of this country uh, you know, anticipated. No, I think you're right, Steve. And we think of news or political news in terms of things like tax cuts or what's going to happen with Social Security or, you know, the terrible situation with police officers. But what we do in this film is take you to the darkest corners of the world because that's where a lot of the money is flowing to the Clintons. And so, you know, as you saw in this film, you have to deal with ugly issues like warlords. You have to deal with uh, the problems of tribal violence. You have to deal with uh, the issues of people being oppressed around the world. And so it is a very sobering thing. And oftentimes I think we want to kind of bifurcate and say, well, that's going on in the rest of the world. America's different and we can have our own debate. But in this case with the Clintons, they are so much tied up with what is going around the world. It's important, I think, to bring that barrier down. So, yeah, it is a sobering film. It's not necessarily a fun film, although I must say I always chuckle, you know, when Bill Clinton in the film says, you know, we got to pay the bills, uh, as if that explains, uh, uh, you know, why they're doing what they're doing with certain people. But uh, it's important for people to see this because it allows them to see the sorts of people that the Clintons are choosing to associate with. I, I want to address two issues for our fam uh, for the audience as, as we wrap up tonight, and you think about this later or sure with friends, is that are the Clintons, the first thing, are the Clintons that cynical? I mean, one of the things the film shows is that whether it's human trafficking, whether it's arms control, whether it's nuclear proliferation, are they that cynical to really take these areas where ideologically they are more aligned to people uh, on the left, people at the Democratic Convention, and to really try to monetize that? Is it, is it, are they that cynical? Uh, you know, it's hard to look into their minds. I don't think it's cynicism. I think that the Clintons have done, which other people in politics do as well to varying degrees, uh, is they have created in their mind a sense of their own goodness. Uh, that they are on the right side of history, they have the right ideas, they're smarter, they have the nation's interests at heart. And then that allows them, in a sense, to make these massive compromises or these cynical plays uh, and defend it intellectually to themselves. So I don't think it's cynicism. I think they, in a sense,